Welcome to another week of Investors Gallery. My name is Presley. Um, I am half of Dimensional Capital, Melvin Faraby the third. I'm going to put him out there this week. Melvin Faraby Esquire the third is the other half of Dimensional Partner. And we do multifamily stuff. We do envelop, uh, development and stabilize uh, anything that gives a really good return. And I'm here in Houston. And for those who are watching or listening for the first time, Investors Gallery is shot in my home. So everything behind me, um, I was able to build with my, my own two. I've been doing, doing construction since about seven years old. And on the other side is my art gallery. Hence the reason Investors Gallery. But I brought this platform to all the internet places to be able to give access to um, amazing people like Nick, which we'll talk to in a second, to be able to let listeners and individuals who have questions about investing or whatever the expert that I have on, give them access and be able to understand, hey, in your world, how do I do this? How do I get to where you are today? So I have Nick on. Nick, I appreciate you coming on. Tell us about yourself and, and how you got into all the things that you're into now. Presley, first of all, thanks for having me. I feel like with your panel in the back and, and mine here too, we should be having like cigars. And if I drank scotch much, we'd have that too. <laughs> <She'd be> like... <laughs> I feel like we're at like an old country club or something. Uh, I normally have a, um, I, you know what? I have one from, from yesterday. I normally have a glass of uh, juice with caffeine in it, but okay. I drunk the last one this morning. So I'm out. I just got some, <laughs> some fortified water here right now. Now, so again, thanks so much for having me. Uh, give you a quick, you know, my elevator pitch of, of what I'm all about. So Nick Cooper, I was a 22 year Navy helicopter pilot. So I retired last year. So I flew helicopters uh, my whole career and I was a flight instructor and kind of how I got into what I do now. So I'm in multifamily, so apartment complexes. And initially I started a single family. So like most folks in the military, you move a lot and you buy a house and by default you move, you can't sell it. So you become a landlord. So I acquired a, a very small portfolio. And after about 17 years, I did the math one day in my last rental that I had left and I was like, whoa, this thing is making me a whole $150 a month. I'm like, this is not an investment. Like this is like a hobby considering I have, I had, you know, about $350,000 in this property in equity. It wasn't making me a return. So I did some quick research and realized that, hey, I got to do something I can scale at. And I looked at a bunch of books, podcasts, and jumped, you know, headfirst into multifamily. And from decision to sale, I sold my place within 30 days. And within four months later, I had my first apartment complex, which is a 24 unit outside of Ohio. It's in Painesville. And from there, I did four more uh, syndications and I'm at from one to 172 doors at the moment and looking to expand even more. Within a year? Uh, a, year was, a year was 24. And then the last two, three, three years has been 172. So five more, four more deals total. And okay. yeah. So tell me about what was your mindset um, when you're in the military? Like, did you intentionally have this asset or you know as, as a rental properties or was it kind of like you said was it more just default and it was like I don't want to sell it I think the most mature thing to do is to rent it that's a great question yeah I think it's you kind of fall into it I bought it at 24 and it was a big purchase for me and it was it, I lived in it and then I moved away and you, the market as most people will know there's cyclists in the market I got caught up in that market cycle where I couldn't sell so to give you some quick numbers, I bought it for $327,000 in 2002. Three years later, it was $550,000. I thought I was a genius. Two years after that, went down to three fifty dollars in 2008. Mm -hmm. So I sold it in 2019, and it took it that 14 years to get back to the peak again. So people say California real estate always goes up. Yeah, it does, but not sometimes in the midterm and the short term, it does not. Always. Wow. So that's a very long winded, winded uh, answer. So to, 
it was by default. I became, it, these are meant to be single family homes that I was just like living in and I became landlord and investor kind of by, by accident. So I wasn't intentional about it at first. Hmm. What was the trigger? So you, you, you saw your, your, your net cash flow and it was like, yeah. man, this is 150 bucks. And you know, if the tenant leaves, then, you know, now you're negative. What was the trigger to say to, to bring you into multifamily? Uh, that's a that's a really good one. So everyone has that aha moment, that moment where you're like, oh man, never again. So I was sitting in my, I lived in a one bedroom downtown like condo at the time. And my then girlfriend looks at me and she's like, now wife, she's like, what, what's your plan for after the military? This is four years ago, almost to the day. And I was like, I, yeah, I didn't have an answer for her. And that pretty much gave me a pretty big gut punch to be like, my only answer was like, well, I guess I'll still fly. And that wasn't, you know, there wasn't like a plan. Like I look back and I was 41 at the time and that was uh, not really a good answer. And it just really kicked me in the high gear. Be like, Hey, how do I provide? How do I, you know, keep this girl around? How do I provide for a family? And I just realized like I was dabbling in, in single family. I wasn't really, um, not, I wouldn't say I'm taking it seriously. It's just, I wasn't able to scale it. And I think it's just what it gets down to is that, you know, in 17 years of being a multifamily, I had a handful of properties. And at that point I had one left and from going go to close on multifamily, I had 24 units in four months. So to answer the question, it's, it's a woman, woman inspired me to, to get my act <laughs> together, get going on it. And, and I think it's also that I didn't want to just work as like a W2 employee the rest of my life. And I saw my, my career ahead of me, which, Hey, no shade is that being a pilot was really great, but you know, I flew helicopters and definitely there's an element of danger to it. And I saw that more of that. And I think it's a, a younger person's game and it's really exciting when you're young, but when you're older, you really want to kind of uh, dial down on what you're good at. And I realized this is something I could really, I'm really good at. I, I led teams in the military. I was the command officer of a, of a small unit before I retired. And this is like more of what I did before is that, hey, building teams and getting it where a single family, I felt like a lot of it was just on your own. You're like a lone wolf. Whereas multifamily, hey, you're part of a team. Yeah, uh, we, we tend, after 40, you tend to get out the bed a little bit different. And I'm, <laughs> I'm uh, not going on that door. <laughs> <laughs> What kind of uh, uh, helicopters did you fly? Oh, so I flew um, in the Navy. I flew uh, H-60s. It's the Seahawk. So it's pretty much the Navy's version of the Blackhawk. So and the coolest I, helicopter you could possibly fly then, basically. I, it's a utility helicopter. I mean, that's it could do a lot of cool things. And I think it was just, it was really awesome experience. And I flew, did it for 22 years. And I wouldn't change anything at all, but... Uh, you just realize that at a certain point, it's like, it's time to pivot to something and this, everything is going to end, whether you decide to, or someone else decides to, you got to mm -hmm. make that decision and pivot. The only thing that's constant is change. Exactly. So <laughs> you're hitting the, 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 I don't want to say pain points. You're hitting a lot of the areas for people who are going to be watching this, who are either in their first deal or about to go into their first deal or want to do their first deal. What was the stress like once you basically liquidated your, your single family and now you have a check that you can write? How did you mentally get through that? And how, what did you do to prepare through education, like books, seminars, maybe a mentor to help you prepare for that mental transition? Yeah, I think that, you know, when I did that, sold that that house, that last rental I had, it was the largest check I've, I've ever seen in my life. And I realized that, you, you know, I think that when you really dive into something, I went all in. So I did podcasts, read podcasts, books, bigger pockets. And I think that it's it's more the action than the knowledge. I think that your competence will get you far enough, but you have to be confident. So I knew I'd figure it out and I knew, I'd, and how did I figure it out? Not by just staying in my house in San Diego, because for me at the time, I couldn't, I wasn't looking for deals in San Diego. I had to go somewhere where I could actually make that money into more units. Like I didn't want to buy another single family house because like you mentioned, 
one person leaves, 100% vacant, and then you're you're paying that bill. So I was able to go somewhere that was a cash flowing area, and it was a lower price of entry. And I think that that's just something that where does your money go furthest? And I think it's it's the whole saying of, hey, live where you want, invest where it makes sense. And with that capital that you have, you have to give that capital a job. And I'm going to kind of you know pull a string a bit on what I was saying before is that that $350,000 I had, or actually $347,000 that I had, I felt like that was like an ice cube that was slowly melting. Like with even then with inflation, even more now that I had to put that somewhere. But you also don't want to be that desperate buyer. So you really have to go all in and figure out what's my market, where am I going to go? How do I do this? What kind of systems do I have? And I took off two and a half, three weeks of work and just went, I flew out to Ohio and I was driving around the state for three, four weeks, like a, like a crazy person trying to find something. Wow. How did you, how do I properly pose this? So you, you, you went from, let's call it a, well, let's say military. Cause I, I don't want to say W2 because even though it is a W2, I want to give it the respect that it deserves. Oh, it's W2. It's still W2. And, that's and, okay. And I appreciate your service. Um, your support. Pre um, you went from uh, this, this, this job to basically becoming an entrepreneur. Yes. How did you get from clocking in, clocking out to having these relationships or, or building the relationships to find properties and to meet brokers or wholesalers or however you got to deal? Or was it just driving for dollars is how you found the property? It was picking up that phone. That's the biggest thing and putting yourself in a room where other people are doing it. And that's what got me there. And also what made me really scale was getting that coach because your this your motivation and confidence will get you will get you far but really when you get a coach and a mentor that's where you really level up and that's what i had that's what really got me to that those last four those four properties was having that coach having that confidence to be like hey i know what i'm doing and and just get me there i think the biggest thing that the coach does is you're able to buy their mistakes mm -hmm. so i don't have to spend those either i spent it with a coach and, and Presley, I know you do coaching or you, you, you have, you've been coached before and we've all spent close to six figures, if not more on the coaching. And I look at this way, I'm going to pay that coach in education and, and his learning, his mistakes, or I'm going to pay in the street, which gonna cost me way more. Mm -hmm. Do you uh, feel comfortable disclosing which coach you went through since he, he or she seems to be uh, an amazing person? Um, it was with a mastermind that I had, okay. so it was, it was a great coach. And I think it's, it's definitely what gets you kind of leveled up. Definitely. Definitely. Um, and, and your response is very consistent with everyone that I've spoken to, um, in the past about how much they've spent on coaching. It's always, I think I've only spoke to one person that it has not been six figures. It's like always six figures in some kind of form of education, masterminds or coaching or both mentors. Um, Tell us how you found the first property. The first property was found uh, through a broker, through phone okay. calls, finding a partner and all that. That's that's where in multifamily, and I'm not sure how many of your folks are multifamily people, but most of the deals go through a broker. There is an element of direct to seller, direct to owner, but it's not as much as single family. So the broker is usually hold the keys to that because most of the buyers are more or the sellers are more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. Was it a value add deal? Oh yeah. Value add deal. So, I mean, I wish I had 10 more of these, you know, I bought it for $762,000. So that's 33,000 a door rents for about 400. And it was from the typical mom and pop. They had a paper ledger and it was, uh, I hadn't raised rents in forever. So I went in there. I didn't raise rents right away. I just, you know, did some improvements and some value add and went from about 400 and change or so rents. Now it's a 750. So I uh, went from being about 762,000 to now it's about, well, not about, it is 1.7 million. So in valuation. So, and that's 
took about two and a half, three years. I did a cash out refi uh, last year and we refinanced out uh, $696,000. So mm -hmm. that was tax deferred. So once mm -hmm. I did that first deal, I was like, what am I doing in the Navy still? That's when I was like, hey, my wife was a catalyst girl from the time to get going. And that's when I realized like, hey, I don't need to do this in the military anymore. It's time to, time to retire. Yeah. Isn't there a certain amount that once you make, make that amount, um, I don't know if you have to get out the military, but you can. Oh, I'm sure. I, I, I wasn't at that level. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a couple of million. Like you win the lottery. It's like, hey, you're too much of a risk in the military if you're like a lottery winner, I think. So. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. And, and hats off to your, uh, your wife and, and then girlfriend for, for being a catalyst. Yeah, um, she's the motivation, man. Nothing like a woman to change you. Yes. Yes. I'm going on, uh, I'm going on 16 years married and almost 20 years together. That's awesome. So, Congratulations. Yeah. That, and I gotta say like you being married is my biggest accomplishment. That is by far over any of these deals, entrepreneurs, that's, that's my relationship is, is my accomplishment, my greatest one. <laughs> that's an amazing way to think about it. Yeah. What's your, what's your, what's your goals? What's, what's on the horizon? What do you look at as, um, maybe not an end point, but what's your focus to get to? As far as for business wise, uh, this year and next year is all about growth. So keep expanding. We closed on two deals last year and got about 50% larger. And so this year uh, closed on about two more. And I think it's all about this year is about being creative. And so a lot of it is you, you do have the element of some direct to seller at this point and creative financing. So that's going to be more of uh, like a seller carry back or the seller carries the note back for you. And I think the biggest thing about 23 is that this is the year of the operator. You have to operate those properties right and correctly. So yep. the market is not going to save you. Those cap rates that are compressing every year that were last year aren't going to save you. You have to get your expenses under control and your income up and keep mm -hmm. those, residents, those residents happy. What was your biggest challenge on, um, on your properties, either the first one or the ones you have now? I'd say the first one I had was uh, COVID. So I bought it what, five, six months before COVID. So you didn't know people were going to keep paying their rent. And it's just like, you have to be able to work with them. And one thing that I came to realization is that the property is not really the asset at all. It really is that resident there paying it down. So paying you rent, that is really the asset. You can attract that good resident and keep them. That's what you have to think about. And that resident's the one who actually increases the value. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. What would you do different in buying your first property? Uh, besides starting 10 years earlier? Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would have bought more. I would have, at that point, uh, I was out of capital with, with that pro I put all in for my, my sale and I would have, um, leveled up earlier as far as meaning other people's money. So the first property was all mine. So as far as my capital, so I brought that in, I learned with my own money. And once I learned, okay, I can do this definitely showed success. Now I'm ready for other people's money. And I think that I would definitely would have moved in that quicker. Uh, partnered up with other people that were doing it quicker as well. Did the lender give you, um, I don't want to say a hard time, but being that this was your first property, did you have to jump through any hoops did, that you feel might've been because it was your first property? Um, I think also because it was such a low amount that it was, you're basically putting 50% down that there was really no risk to them. And then this was, it was 2019, so the rates were not too bad, actually. You know, it was like a 5% rate, but it was a 20-year amortization, so a commercial loan with, with a community bank. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's pretty good. Did you refinance into the lower rates? I did. I did okay. refinance uh, end very end of last year or end of 21. I think it finished up in 22 into... Mm -hmm which we call agency debt, which is a uh, Freddie small balance, uh, small balance loan. So mm -hmm. refinance that into um, 
let's see about high, like a 3.85 rate mm -hmm. and you get three years interest only and amortize over 30 years. So to give you an idea, even after that refi and pulling out almost $7,000, I'm still cash flowing that after expenses and debt service, $6,000 a month. Mm, mm -mm. You're buying ice cream when you come down here. That's right. Ice cream. Free. <laughs> Hot fudge Sunday, whatever you want, man. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, what hat do you wear going forward with your... Because I'm assuming now you have a team or one other person, or is it just you and your wife? For the no, my, so my wife does. We are partnered up together, but I'm also partnered up with a uh, with another group. So my partner Andrew, he is a lot of the uh, investor relations, and he's done a lot of the uh, direct to seller. So he started off in single family, built up a portfolio of about 300 properties in New York, and we're looking to expand into into Central Florida and also into back into Texas. So I own in Texas also. Hmm. So which, what would you say your hat is? My hat would be the asset management and the capital raise. And he mm -hmm. would be more the broker relations and the acquisition portion of that. Do so, you? Go ahead. Uh, go ahead. No, I said for the service last deal. So my, my wife comes in because we're, we are a couple, but we also are in business together is that she is in sales and she's uh medical sales. So we are able to do a lot of um, capital raising Merck contacts as well. So for the last mm -hmm. deal, we raised uh, 1.2 million for that. And that was done in about a week, a week and a half. And, you know, the advice I always give is, well, how do you raise money for a deal? It's like you raise it before you have the deal. Yeah. So most of these are prior relationships. And she's in a perfect industry. Oh, doctors, yeah. is this, she uh, the doctor side or dentist side? Uh, she's in the, the sales side. So she sells to the doctors. The the doctors. Physicians. Oh yeah. yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> so it works out pretty well. It's a good, uh, it's a good synergy, her and I. Um, doctors and um, I interviewed uh, Satch. Um, can't say his last name, ben, ben, Bendart. And he does, yeah. um, he came from the airlines. So he has kind of a, a pipeline of a lot of pilots. Okay. Uh, with, like, hey man, doctors and pilots, you can't really beat no. that. <laughs> no. no, I think it's it's the same thing as like you. I'm also at the age where uh, many of my peers and contemporaries are reaching their prime earning years. You know, mid late 40s into 50s is where you really start. That needle starts to move a lot faster. Yeah. How is life? You used to, I, I don't even want to know what time you used to wake up. <laughs> <In the military. laughs> I'm sure before the sun came up, how was life now and how has life changed since then? You know, I, I like looking at that because I think when you really look back on where you where you come from, it really brings a lot of joy because as a pilot, my life was no schedule at all. Like I was a slave to that schedule and you didn't have a, so you would find out what you're doing the night prior. And when I first started dating my girlfriend, I watched you like, what do you mean you don't know what you're doing tomorrow? I'm like, I don't know. It could be I'm flying tomorrow night. It could be tomorrow afternoon. I could be doing nothing. They're like, that's not possible. I'm like, yeah, yeah, it is. So I'd say it was a lot more. You think the military is is chaotic. Uh, it, it looks like it's a lot of order, but there's chaos within a lot of that order. Mm -hmm. um, hitting with those fancy uniforms and those rules, there's, there's a lot of stuff that that you can't control. And I think most part, if you get in the eye, what I'm saying here is that you don't have any control. Like I didn't have control of where I went, when I went and how I was going to do it. You just have to go. So don't know, just go. And, and now I look back and see like, that was a great experience. And my life now, like just today, I was, you know, doing a Zoom call and at noon, my wife was here and we were able to have lunch together. Like that never would have happened like three, four yeah. years ago. Uh, yeah. This didn't happen. So I think it's all about, it's not just the, but real estate did for me as far as like, you know, the money, it's like, it's the lifestyle because that's really what you're looking for. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. Um, I've kind of was born in a real estate, so I've kind of been in and out of that. And to have that freedom to just say, hey, that's, you know, I don't have any meetings and you don't, let's go out for lunch or a brunch or something like that. The freedom that, that comes with that is, it's, 
refreshing and surreal and it almost feels like you're you're cheating life <laughs> like you're not working hard enough but yeah it's definitely a, a great feeling and I'm glad you were able to experience that what what are you doing to do better invest better know better outside of maybe just reading more maximize or something like that how are you making your brand better um you feel or you would say um that's a good question i would say it's mostly by seeing what others are doing so you're looking around because you have every market's got a cycle so we're in a cycle now and you have to be able to look at where we're at and how can i weather these cycles so coming back to what i said before is about this is the year of the operator you have to know how to operate those properties not just about great deal under contract, closing, high five at the table. No, it's like you have to implement a business plan and run it. So this is the year where you really get your systems in place and you really fine tune it and make sure this thing can operate and weather the storm. And you're also looking at, like, hey, there, there's still people with capital that's hungry on the wayside waiting for stuff to drop. Is it going to drop 40, 50%? Probably not, but it's going to be a drop. And if you wait for the bottom, Bottom, you're going to miss it. So if anything here is that if something is cash flows and it makes sense in this market with interest rates or any market, I'm, I'm buying it. How do you feel about the markets um, now? And where do you think the markets are going? I think there's going to be some short and medium term pain. I mean, we all look at the news and I think it's going to keep rising. Uh, will it have a break next year? I believe so that it probably will have some kind of decrease as far as interest rates. But I think that this interest rate market and all this money printing has made everything more expensive, especially real estate. And this is just where it's going to be a correction. You can't just keep going up, up and up. And a lot of these people that started in the last three, four years in real estate haven't gotten punched in the face yet. Like I was around in 08. I didn't feel very good holding on to those places that you, you couldn't really do anything with. So that's why I'm positioned differently this year to make sure my properties are operating and cash flowing, even in the downturn. What's your view and your position on marketing your brand? Because you're doing phenomenal. You have amazing connections, um, but you're, you're kind of a, a, a best kept secret because you don't really have to need to um, syndicate as much as other people because you kind of you you have a stronger I feel you have a, a stronger foundation than some people would have come from um what's your thoughts on branding and just kind of being out there or are you just kind of leaving that to your wife uh, that's that's you know those are the things that she's definitely excels at as far as the social media and that but I think it's a lot of it's coming down to you know, I've noticed is that three four years ago your branding under whatever, you know, uh, Polaris Capital or BlackRock, all the stuff. Now it's like the brand is more you. You're yeah. the brand. People don't want to invest in your whatever name your LLC is that you, you thought was so cute. They want to invest in you. That's who they're investing in. That's, that's why I think that that's why your brand is your biggest asset. Because you lost everything as long as you still have your word. Because in the military, you know, everything is about your integrity and your word. That's what you have the most. That's your most valuable asset is, is you and you're the brand. Mm -hmm. Have you um, had any thoughts on expanding your brand or expanding the markets that you're going to invest in? Uh, I think that you do want to go really deep in a few markets. So I'm not just in one. I'm looking at a few. I won't tell you exactly where because you have listeners here. <laughs> <laughs> But I think you really do have to dial in to where you're going to invest and just kind of figure out, hey, does this make sense? So for me, I live in California. I don't invest in California at present. Doesn't mean there's no deals here. It just means that for me, with the cash flowing op opportunities are way better in other places. So wherever I invest in, I have to have someone that's actually there. The proverbial boots on the ground. Someone that's on my general partner team that's involved in it and running it that's there within like a couple hours. And that comes from, from experience and, and having that in the past where I didn't have that. How deep down do you go into the sub market or do you 
look at the general city for the most part and pick an area? Do you dive dive really deep into uh, the sub market returns and and the areas and the growth? Yeah, I mean, I think you gotta dive in deep because I mean, all real estate is you know you have to find a good growing market, but a lot of that dials into is like, hey, what's the income in the area? And you can't change, you know, you can't move the property, right? So I think a lot of people get uh, that deal-itis and realize like they have to get a deal. Even they overlook a lot of the areas. So there's things that you can do. Hey, you better go look at that property, tour that property and come back at nighttime and see what it's like. It may be a totally different property than you thought in the daytime. So you do have to be that and walk the neighborhood. Go to a restaurant there and figure out. So don't just buy something on the internet and just be like, okay, we're good. Say we're good. No, you have to actually go in there and do it. Do your due diligence. Uh, so I think that you can do a cursory look in the very beginning. Cool, good market. Awesome. You know, it's growing. Jobs are coming here. Oh, awesome. Amazon opened up, you know, about two miles away. But you do have to dial in that neighborhood because it's going to affect everything. You can't change that. Do you have a specific, um, well, let, let me, let me ask you a, in a different way. Yeah. What's your buy box? As far as like uh, parameters or. Yeah. Yeah. Just parameters, nothing over this, nothing under that. What, what do you like? What's your soft spot? What do you like to stay in? I like to stay in something that's 1980s or newer. Uh, and I like to have, if, if you, if your audience knows uh, class C, class B, value add. So it's a place where I can increase the rents. And I really want something closer to 100 units, but I'm definitely, if I have someone in the area that's local, willing to look lower down to 40. 40 to 100. 40 to 100. Okay. I think it's it really the scale start. I mean, yeah, scale starts at four and above, but really it starts to really move the needle about 40, you know, more significantly. How how are you seeing LOIs being reacted to now versus a year, two years ago for your, uh, your size of properties? You know, it's, it's, it's definitely night and day. And I, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story is that I went to this is three, four years ago when it started three years ago, when it started getting really hot and I went to a broker and he was a lot, he was a big broker. He knew I was brand new and he's like, Hey, I'm seeing you today. I, I know you're new. I don't need you at all right now, but one day I'll need you. And that day has come because I'm an owner and I'm getting calls from every broker about all my properties. So I think that the ties definitely shifted. You can see just in the transactions. I think there's the lowest amount of transactions in the last 12 years in multifamily. So Owners aren't really marketing their property or putting it on a market. And there's a lot less groups that are sitting by the wayside. So the advantage is now is that hey, if the deal works and it cash flows, put an offer on it. Like you gotta also remember, begin with the end in mind. What is my returns gonna be? What do I need to make this work? And then back it up and offer from there. Mm -hmm. hey, if it insults the person, so what this is this isn't March of 22 anymore. It's a new reality. A lot of folks think it still is. You just, for the people who don't know the industry, you just painted such a, a vivid picture of, <laughs> of multifamily at, at that time. Um, so in, 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 under, in seeing that we are in different times, are you also seeing that in the pricing or, and or the cap rates? Yeah, cap rates are definitely expanding whether people think it's or not. I mean, it has to. All expenses are going up. So that's going to affect your net operating income, which is going to affect your cap rate. So every cap rate is going to expand. No matter where you're at, it's going to expand. Uh, interest rates are up as well. That's going to affect your cash flow. That's going to affect your return. So what was, I'm not sure how sophisticated your, your investors are, but what was a mid-teens Internal rate of return, which is good, is probably in the low teens now. So those are you have to also restate your expectations and your investor expectations too. 
Yeah. Both of those things are like, well, I want my deal and I want to be out in two years and double my money. Like that's not the market anymore. It's not going to happen. You're going to be, you know, five years. It's a five-year hold. Mm -hmm. So it is like, hey, this is, this is what it is. This is a reality. And I think people think that's going to change. I mean, it, it's always changing, but I think that they haven't accepted reality yet. Most owners What's haven't accepted what the reality is of the market. What's been the feedback on your end as far as trying to paint a slightly different picture to your investors? Uh, they, they see the news as well. I mean, investors look at you as, as the expert. I look at this as like, I'm the pilot, on the plane, I'm flying us there. I want to get us there. Everyone is the passengers, but we still want to arrive alive. So they trust your judgment to check all those things out, like check for the weather, check the runways, all that stuff here. So they trust you, you know, most investors aren't in the markets looking at this all the time. They're not as savvy with real estate as, as the general partner is. So it is telling them, hey, this is the reality now, and this is what the deal is going to be. Uh, doesn't mean there's not good deals. Out there. There's still great deals out there. People are still closing. I'm still mm -hmm. seeing it. I'm still mm -hmm. offering. And it's just like, like I said before, is like, if you wait too long, you're going to miss the bottom. You can't turn the bottom. Mm -hmm. Yep. And the market will be back on the rise before you know it. And you'd be mad at yourself. <laughs> yep. Yep. That's good. That's, that's, uh, what would you say, um, since the market is softening, that uh well two two questions but we'll start with one have you seen deal flow for you pick up a lot deal flow has picked up it's not what it was a year ago but you're getting a lot more stuff like from the from the brokers like wink wink this is off market so you're seeing a lot of owners that are shopping their deals and trying to get feedback on where it's at and i think they're not liking the feedback so a lot of them are going to just hold it uh, some of them have debt due this year and they're in a bad situation. So there'll be some distressed deals. I feel in the next quarter two, quarter three of this year, actually in quarter two already. But uh, I think that the, exp the, the expectations of the owners and the buyers are, there's a big delta between the two. Mm -hmm. still. And that's going to be, it's like, no more, more pain is going to come until that actually gets closer. How long do you think that's going to take to level out? I'd say end of this year, quarter four, maybe Q1 of, of 24, from what I, my, my opinion. Because people, it, life happens all the time. People die, people get divorced, partnerships break up. People are always going to sell. You can't hold this forever. Yeah. Have you thought about doing a fund for your properties or to buy more properties? I think... A fund is, is a great, is a great thing. But I also think one thing about it is that a disadvantage of it is that it would make you, if you, once you have that capital in your fund, you have to go buy something. So I don't want to feel like that pressure to buy a deal. that doesn't really work for the fund because as, as an operator, like that is your number one goal is don't lose money for your, you don't lose investor money. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Like, I don't want to have to be in a situation where I feel like I have to place this capital somewhere that is in the best interest of our, of our investors. Yeah. Yeah. The, the Warren Buffett rule. Yeah. Let me check and see if we have any questions. No question. How's oh, that good, huh? Brilliant entry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I uh, I had a notification that there was a question. Um, I usually wait to the end and ask if, ask anyone if they have any questions. Um, so now that I bring it up, is there anyone who has any questions or comments um, for Nick before I ask him a few more questions and uh, let him get some rest tonight? <laughs> I'm West Coast time. Not too bad. You're a little later there. <laughs> Hanging out in the gallery. Okay, no questions. Oh, you know what? Helps if I um, take everybody off of mute. All right, last time, any questions or comments? Yep, you were that good. 
<laughs> uh, like it already. Um, so I will leave everybody um, the opportunity to unmute themselves if they uh, want to chime in or, or ask any questions. What would you say outside of the mastermind is, or maybe even including the mastermind, is the single most beneficiarial What would you, what tool would you give someone watching or listening to help them start getting into multifamily? Yeah, you can't do it on your own. So 100% is coaching. And like, this is a semi plug. I, I coach as well. I do custom one-on-one -on -one coaching. And I think that's what really, a mastermind will get you very far. And I think that a lot of that education is important, but really what you need is someone that's been there, done that. and that's what's really going to make it and lessen that curve for you to get to that goal. So there's A and there's Z, there's a lot of letters in between. How are you going to shortcut that and step over, you know, B and C to get to Z? And that's what a coach will do for you. And everyone's different. Everyone's a different situation in their life. Uh, you're going to pay for this either way, whether it's with a coach or you're gonna pay on the street. And that's, like I said before, it's, it's it's going to save you. Yep. Go ahead and and, and buy that uh buy that pain and experience up front. Yeah, so pay for someone else's mistakes. Because you mm -hmm. don't have enough time to do it. Like I was 41. I didn't have 20 years to figure this out. You know, could I figure this out in 20 years? Hell, yeah, of course. But it'd be 20 years later. I wanted yeah. I wanted to shortcut it. And that was the way to really shortcut it and really move the needle. What is the, the biggest surprise um, or something that you didn't really expect going from what you think life is going to be like operating in this space and now actually being in this space? Um, I thought the money would be very hard to get. I thought it would be. And that was a limiting belief I had was that who's going to invest in me? There's, there's no one's going to be any money. And what you realize is the more you do this, the more experience you get, people see your success and, and they want to invest with you. So that was the thing for me is like, I never thought I could raise a million dollars. I did it. We've done it three times. So I never thought, and these are things that, you know, this last time you raised, raised capital, it was done like in a week, no, no webinar, just from phone calls. So I think it is maybe going along on this one here, but it's all about those, you know, those phone calls you make and you're that one connection or one phone call away from that next investor, that next deal. That's how I got my first deal, picking the phone up. That's it. So it's just, it is putting yourself out there. And I think the confidence will help a lot. And I think a lot of folks really hide in like, oh, hey, I'm listening to a podcast or this book. You know, I'm going to, once I get this done, I'm, I'm going to start like, no, you're not. Like you, you're not going to start. You're going to keep on doing the same thing. And I, and I read before us, I actually heard about this. Someone, Bigger Pockets, right? On their podcast, they interviewed one of the guys or the host. And they said, how many people here have a deal listening to this podcast? And he said, some like 95% of them don't have a deal. So that's just, that's entertainment if you're not doing anything. So all these books you read, impress, I'm sure you read a lot. We both do. What does it matter if you don't take action? Yeah, I know the gallery, the library. Uh, if you don't read these books and do and take action, things you learn. What is it? Why'd you read this book? That's very it's, powerful. It's entertainment. Wow. It's entertainment. It's very bad entertainment. There's, I much rather would, I don't know, watch Game of Thrones or something. But <laughs> you don't do anything with these books. Why do you have them? Hmm. You know, every episode I get a bumper, I either get a bumper sticker or a t-shirt. I think that's a little bit of both. That, <laughs> that, is, that is very deep, very deep and very powerful. And, and I hope people understand the, the gravity of that. Because if you understand that you're watching or reading entertainment, and if it's supposed to be for the purposes of to take action and you're not, um, hopefully it'll be a, you know, it'll make you change and it'll make you say, you know what, I'm reading this to take action. I need to take action. Yeah. Like when you're reading that book and it says, Hey, fill out these like things to, to go through your life. 
what you should do. Like, don't just like, read through it, get your pen out and start filling it in, start doing things and, and, and taking note of that. Mm -hmm. I've been an um, a audible baby for the last ooh, probably two years. Yeah. Um, and a lot of the auto audio books um, have PDFs attached. Exactly. Um, so that's something that, that is um, uh, a benefit as well. Man, that's amazing. What, which, before I let you go, what's, what's a gold nugget? You've given many of them. So <laughs> well, what's a gold nugget you want to drop on our audience before you leave? I would say that you are only that one phone call away from your next deal. Mm. Like I would say that you, that is action is going to get you there. Don't hide in that education. So take action, level up with someone who's doing it, latch on to someone who's already doing it, get a mentor or a coach and take action because these audiobooks and these podcasts, they are not going to get you there. Right. Trust me. I've talked to people from five years ago that were like telling me, oh, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. No, you're not. Take action. I got a big sign around here. Let's see it. Does it say take action. <laughs> it's uh, it, it's kind of, it was from a Tim, Tim, uh, Tony Robbins uh, conference who he, he's not human. He's definitely an alien with uh, as much yeah. energy as he has. He did the whole like 13, 14 hours and took a five minute break. Like I was there in person. This is not something that I heard. I saw the man talk yeah. for like 13 hours straight and took a five minute break to use the bathroom and then came back and then we did the fire walk. Um, but anyway, it, it says uh, two millimeters. And the, the concept is if you just move just a little bit consistently, yeah. then eventually you'll get where you want to be. Um, but we like taking massive action. And I think that's for the most part, the, the best way to go, um, you know, use common sense. Um, have counsel um, and go in with education, but taking massive action is how you become successful. And that's what we do. We're investors. And at some level, whether it be small or great, we're risk takers. I like to be on a, the, the smaller end, but <laughs> we're still risk takers. So, man, you've been amazing. I really appreciate you coming on. Um, I, if you come to, are you coming to, um, Oh, MFN was already passed. When I come to Houston, man, uh, make sure I'm, you. I'm uh, saying you know. your, your crib there. We're, it's like we're going to hang out there. I How got enough space. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely got enough space. I just added 500 and something odd. I shouldn't say that out loud. But yeah, I added a, a lot of square footage to the house. So yeah, definitely got space. <laughs> well, yeah, come good. on. Great. The next podcast in the other room for, uh, you know, next year will be in the 24 position here. Greatest hits. Yeah. <laughs> um, when you come, you'll take me in a black hawk and I'll, I'll take you in whatever uh, airplane I'm flying at the time. Let's do it. Let's do it. I'm <laughs> ready. <laughs> All right, everybody. This was Nick, man. You've been amazing. I, I get along so well with other pilots. We just, we always have this vibe. I think pilots right. just have this thing. It's kind of like uh, people ride motorcycles. They just, it's like an unspoken bond we just instantly have. <laughs> No, I appreciate I, you having me on. And, yeah, I appreciate uh, you coming, man. If anyone wants to reach out, it's uh, my email. I'll give that out. It's Nick, that's N-I-C at HudsonBlueMF.com. And also, if you want to reach out to me on uh, Facebook, it's at Nick Hooper. And uh, same with LinkedIn, at Nick Hooper. Both are great to reach out to me. So reach out. Let's chat. Talk real estate. Yeah, and I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because um, this, is, this is for the purpose of marketing and circling around the interwebs um so I'm, I'm glad you didn't forget that um and i will also grab that information from you as well i, I think i already have it in the um Cattendonly, and I'll, I'll post that, that information works. when i um chop it up and put it on the internet so all right man thank you nick for coming Perfect. on i appreciate it uh, and, super uh, fun, Leslie. thank you so much for having me on this is a blast yes sir see you next time all right we'll see you all right bye.